All right, so this morning, what I'm going to talk about is uh, this idea that with God, all things are possible. Um, I have heard this for years, that with God, all things are possible. I would like to be experiencing that right now. I don't know about you, uh, but it feels like sometimes that is just the opposite of what my experience is. And yet what I know is I have to go back to spiritual truth and endeavor to bring my experience up to truth rather than bring truth down to my experience. Do, do you know what I mean? Um, it's, uh, I think it's one of the greatest statements uh, that Jesus makes, and it's from Matthew. And he is, he's actually blessing the children. And uh, along, uh, one comes to him and says, uh, what do I do to enter into eternal life? And he says, well, keep the commandments, you know? And so, uh, so we understand that, keep the commandments. You know, this is the basic outline. This is what God gave Moses on the mountain back in the Old Testament. And remember, so why did people even need commandments? Because they were wild, that's why. They were mostly undeveloped consciousness. You know, you did something I didn't like, I turned around, I killed you. There, that's how it was, right? So for, 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 for consciousness to evolve, God gives Moses these Ten Commandments, and, and you know, we're not going to do all of them, but you basically know what they are. You know, it's no murder, and don't commit adultery, and don't steal, and don't bear false witness, and honor your father and mother, love your neighbor as yourself, on and on and on. It sounds really good. Why did people need those rules, though? Because as soon as Moses turned his back on the people, they were wild, right? They, they melted down their jewelry and created a golden calf, and they were dancing around the calf, worshiping the calf. And Moses is like, wait a minute, we're... The Hebrew people, we believe in one God. We don't have one God and the golden calf, right? It's one God. So, um, and then he gives this different, uh, and so, um, so speed ahead, speed ahead, speed ahead. So now we're in the New Testament, and Jesus gives this other teaching. Uh, he gives this, it's a difficult teaching of, he said, so someone comes up to him and says, you know, well, I've kept the commandments. And Jesus' response is, all right, then go and sell all that you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and you can come and follow me. And the man goes away very sorrow sorrowful because he had great possessions. Right? So then Jesus gives this teaching that it's easier for a rich, uh, I'm sorry, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. So that, we all think, you know, that sounds like something, right? So the disciples are amazed, and they say, you know, well, well, who can be saved? And Jesus says, you know, with man, this is impossible. Humanly, you can only go so far. He says, but with God, all things are possible. And so keeping the commandments is about doing what's right. And so this is how I think, you know, I mean, so I think we've all kind of evolved in consciousness to the point where we get the commandments. And now what we ask ourselves is, what's the next right thing for me to do? What's the right thing, the highest and best thing, the most loving, compassionate thing for me to do in this situation that I am in now? Right? Because we don't need the guidelines that we needed back then. Of course, if you're breaking those guidelines, you might want to reconsider. Um, but they're a, they're a starting place, right? They are, and, and remember that at the time the commandments were given, most of the planet was in undeveloped consciousness, right? People were in survival mode and in struggle mode. You know, so sell everything and give it to the poor should not be taken literally. I know, what a relief, huh? Uh, and, and because that... Uh, and, and does not apply to, to all people who have any, any kind of wealth. I believe that he is speaking about um, active religious teachers who come from town to town. Now, wealth in the East at this time was in sheep and cattle, not in stocks and bonds, right? So to own flocks, these religious teachers of the time, uh, those flocks would have to be cared for. They'd have to be transported. It would be very difficult to be a religious spiritual teacher at the time and have flocks and, and, and all that sort of stuff. Right? So that's just going to be really difficult to do the teaching work you're here to do if you've also got a farm following you everywhere you go. Now also in the East, rich men were, uh, now this comes from, from uh, George Lamsa, who translated the Bible back into Aramaic, which they believe was the language that Jesus spoke. And so in, Lamsa says that in the East, rich men were often hated because of the way they got their wealth, you know, often through some unjust means. So it's not just wealth that, that Jesus seemed to be condemning, but the methods by which it was acquired 
and the greed in hoarding it. So that's very different. This does not mean that possessions are bad or having your needs met is bad or anything like that. You know, wealth will always accumulate in the hands of some people. You know, why? First of all, because they have the consciousness of wealth. They have the consciousness of having their needs met. They believe that their needs will always be met in any and every situation. And also, remember that we are all God's stewards, and we are to use the good that comes to us for the highest and best purposes. Now, the part about this idea of a camel, that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God, that's generally pretty misunderstood. So the Aramaic word gamla uh, means camel, it means a large rope, and it also means a beam. Right? So in ancient languages, it just, so this is not unlike the English language where, where a word could have several different meanings. Right? So there is no connection between camel and needle. Right? That is inaccurate. Right? There is a connection between rope and needle. So it's a translation thing. Do you follow me? Right? So it's easier for a rope to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. So there are different sized needles in the East. We think of a needle and we think of what you maybe repair a button with on your shirt. You know, but there are other needles, different size needles in the East because people travel with tents and they traveled with big carpets and things like that. So uh, different size needles in the East, you know, a good size cord could easily fit through the needle that was used to sew rugs and sew tents together. Right? Now there is no gate in the wall of the city called the Eye of the Needle. That's something that was talked about for decades, that, well, maybe there was a gate in the, uh, 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 called the Eye of the Needle, and it was difficult for the camel to get into the city. No, that's nonsense. That just wasn't so. Jesus' statement is, with, uh, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. I think this is really important for us as spiritual students on a metaphysical spiritual path. You know, I, frankly, I don't know how people go through life without having faith in something. To me, it would be a very scary proposition if you didn't believe in something greater and that you were, in fact, somehow connected to that something greater. You know, because I, I think about this and I think, wow, if people don't believe in God, if they don't believe in spirit, if they don't believe in a higher power in any way, when they meet difficulties, what are they meeting the difficulties with? Just their own human personality, their own human effort. And what they're doing is probably based on what they've been through in the past, because they're not open to any particular revelation of spirit in that moment. So I don't know how people do it. I don't know how people get through difficult things without a belief in God. Because, you know, for me, it's like, you know, when something comes up, I, I, I pray and I meditate and I affirm and I read words of truth and I just like try to inundate myself with a higher level of thinking so that I will have a better experience. You know, in ordinary human consciousness, I understand for all of us, it seems like only so much is possible. In ordinary human consciousness, it seems like only so much is available. We struggle, we effort, we have fear, we experience what everybody else is experiencing. But in a consciousness filled with God, in a consciousness filled with truth, all things are possible. And I know, the human mind immediately goes, but how? How is this going to be possible? That's not our business. In the science of mind, how is not our business. Our business is the what. You have to know where you're headed, where your ship is headed, and be specific. This is about being definite with the infinite. You have to be specific with the infinite. Otherwise, how can the law possibly respond? The law being the basic law of consciousness that we talk about all the time. So a consciousness filled with God, a consciousness filled with truth, to that consciousness, yes, all things are possible. Because what's happening is we're going from finite thinking to infinite thinking, from our finite mind where I have to know how it's possible to an infinite mind where I just need to know the what. God takes care of the how. Now, it seems to me we spend an awful lot of time telling God how big our problems are. Oh, God, help me. Oh, God, this is so difficult. Oh, God, how am I ever going to get through this? You know, it, it, we, we, we can just sort of do a PhD thesis on how great our pain is, you know, and how difficult this is, and how big our debts are, and on and on and on and on and on. But we want to, but, but we have that backwards. I believe we want to tell our problem how big our God is, right? That I must know that God in me is greater than any situation, uh, than any difficulty that I'm going through at any given time. 
But to just think about God is not enough. See, and I, this is important because people think, well, I think about God. Doesn't that count? Well, I suppose it's better than thinking about the trash. But, you know, it's, to think about God is not enough. We have to do our own inner work. Because until we do that inner work, nothing really changes. You know, I have to fill my consciousness with truth. I have to do my own spiritual practice every day. So what is that for us? Well, that's a lot of things. It's pray, study, meditate, affirm, tithe, forgive, do gratitude. All of that stuff is spiritual practice. Now, God is spirit, and the kingdom of God is within you right now. So I do not expect God to intervene uh, where natural laws are concerned. What I do know I have to do as a student of the science of mind, though, is I have to grow my consciousness to better use the spiritual laws of the universe. Right? You know, we read, greater works than this will you do. Well, not if we don't con uh, cultivate a deeper consciousness. If we don't cultivate a greater consciousness, we're not going to do any greater works. The works we're going to do are going to look larger like the works that we've done up until now. Right? So w we won't do great works with the everyday downtown consciousness, right? We have to go up in consciousness, I believe. So yes, we have, we have to have faith in a power greater than we are. And yet, remember, we are all part of this power that's greater. The Ernest said there's a power greater than you are, and you are part of it, right? Jesus said this incredible statement, thy faith hath made thee whole. Wow, my faith is what makes me whole. Faith in what? Faith in a power that's greater than I am, and that's a power that can do things that I humanly cannot even conceive of how that can happen. See, because there is a spiritual intelligence we teach in the science of mind, and that spiritual intelligence is in every cell, every action, every organ, every function of your being is filled with divine intelligence. And so what we are saying to the spiritual intelligence and the life, you know, what we're saying to the spiritual intelligence, to the life force within us, is very important. If you are saying, I'm so sick, you know, oh, I'm such a loser, or I'm alive with the perfection of God, I think that's a good thing to say, that I am alive with the perfection of God. Would you say that with me now? I am alive with the perfection of God. Say it again. I am alive with the perfection of God. Now, check in. See how that feels within you. Doesn't that sort of lift you a little bit? Doesn't that bring a little more light into consciousness in your being? You know, I mean, so, so, so prayer opens the connection between the mind of God and, and the mind of people. Right? So we pray, we meditate, we sit in the silence, we affirm, we chant, we study, we practice gratitude, uh, we forgive. We will be transformed if we renew our mind. Now let me say a word about renewing our mind. St. Paul said this, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. I'm here to tell you that I don't think a lot of renewing is happening. I don't. I think a lot of reolding is happening. I think people just drag out what they've thought before rather than think something new or think something different or possibly be challenged in their thinking. So, so the reason we are maybe not transformed or as transformed as we would like to be, bless you, anything for a blessing, the reason <laughs> is because we have not introduced newness, new, new, and by newness I mean higher thoughts, thoughts aligned with God, thoughts aligned with spiritual truth, into our mind. Most people think the same old thoughts over and over and over again. You know, truly like a broken record. You know how these people used to say, oh, you're like a broken record? How many of us know people and how many of us have been that broken record? Where we just keep telling ourselves the same thing over and over again, even if it doesn't work for us. Now that's the trick, to notice that it's not working for us and change it. And what Ernest Holmes says we have to do to change it is to pour in, pour in. Think of a dump truck, you know, not a drip of water, but a big truck coming and pouring in the constructive opposite. He says that's the key. Because the truth is your mind can only focus on one thing at a time. You're either going to focus on something that's life-affirming or life-negating. You're going to focus on something that's positive or you're going to focus on something negative. And we get to decide every moment what that will be. So most people seem to think old thoughts over and over again. Right? So I think you know, we have free will, though. We were all created with choice. And sometimes, you know, we're out of harmony with God's principle. You know, and some people say, well, if I could just know why. Why is a trap? Just take why off the table completely. You know, we don't need to know why. If I only knew why they didn't like me, if I only knew why they didn't hire me, if I only knew why my stock went down, if I only knew why, blah, 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 blah. It's a trap. 
That is just a trap, because you know what? If you knew why, it wouldn't make any difference. The outcome would still be the same. And people say, no, 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 if I knew why, at least I would be peaceful about that. All right, here's why. Here's why they didn't pick you. They don't like you, OK? There, you have it, right? They didn't pick you, they don't like Are you more peaceful now? No, see, it didn't help. It didn't help at all. You're not more peaceful. So we have to take why off the table. Our mind could be filled with divine thoughts and divine guidance right now. And when our mind is filled with divine thoughts, what you will find is you will have more divine experiences here on Earth. You know, do we want to cultivate a with God, all things are possible way of life? The answer is yes. The answer is hell yes. The answer is yes, hell yes, right now yes. Okay. So we, st we, and our job is to stay close to the truth. Yes, thank you. That's what we do in Science of Mind. Our job is to stay close to the truth. We're confronted in a world with appearances constantly, things that challenge us, things that make us fearful, things that make us doubting, things that make us not want to forgive. You know, and our job as students of the Science of Mind is stay close to the truth. You know, not just think about God, but to actively be in relationship with God, to do a spiritual practice every day. If you want your life to be different, you have to engage in an ongoing spiritual practice. Now, I know that looks different for everybody, but Ernest Holmes said there is no real transformation without ongoing prayer and meditation. There, you have it. Now, you either want to do it or you don't. And if you don't, that's OK. We still welcome you here. It's fine. But I'm telling you, your life would be a lot better if you did a practice. And you can start with something easy. You could just start with things to be grateful for every day. That's not very confrontive, is it? I'm not saying you've got to forgive the big ones right now, although it's coming. Do not kid yourself. It's coming. We absolutely must. You can put it off for a little while. Have you noticed that on the spiritual path? We can put things off for a little while, but they come around again. And then they come around again. And then they come around again. And finally, they loom very large. And it's like, oh, why didn't I take care of this a long time ago when it was just a little thing? I could have handled it so much better then. Now it's big, though, and it requires my attention. So what I have to know is that with God, all things are possible. I have everything within me to meet what's in front of me. Let's pray. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. So we turn our attention inward right now for a moment to recognize that we are all emanations of the Most High God, that each and every one of us, we are made in the image and likeness of God. The qualities of God, the attributes of God exist within each and every one of us. And there is right now perfection within our being. Perfection in mind, perfection in body, perfection in emotions, perfection in our spirit, because this is the way of God. And anything not like that, I speak the word for us today that we are willing to let it go. Anything not like the perfect qualities of God within us, I speak the word that they are dissolved and released, never to return again. And the way is made clear, made clear for us to experience with God all things are possible. So I don't know what it is for you today, but bring something to mind that you are ready to experience. Maybe it's a physical healing. Maybe it's a new job. Maybe it's a healing in a relationship. Maybe it's the ending of a relationship. But whatever it is for you, bring that to mind now and remember that with God, all things are possible. This is what's promised us. With God, all things are possible. So we include in our prayer today our family members and friends, our parents and children, all of our loved ones, everyone we hold near and dear. And we remember that right where they are, God is fully present. There is an infinite loving intelligent spirit that surrounds and fills our loved ones, heals, renews, strengthens, uplifts. We let our prayer be a blessing in the world that we live in. So everything that pulls at our attention, all of those situations that make us fearful, we say God is right there. And the God that's right there is bigger than all of this problem, all of this situation. We bless our church, we bless all churches. We bless synagogues and temples and mosques and ashrams, all paths to God. And I know we're blessed by being together today, that there is raising up for all of us. Everyone gets to be healed. And so with an open, gracious, full heart, I give thanks that this is the truth. I release this word into God's perfect law, and so it is. Together we all say, Amen. Amen.